Okay, guys, today's topic is going to be the beginning of an introduction to what we know as sustainability or development mon durable. Um, is it an either or, in fact? It's an interesting point. In English, sustainability translates as durabilité. But in French, we say développement durable. I think there's a problem there, actually, because in the English speaking world, sustainability means sometimes to sustain the planet. One says no, one does not develop at all. Whereas the implication in French is development is always good, but you just have to make sure it's long term. That's slightly worrying. It seems to suggest that maybe at the root of the modern sustainability movement, there is a little bit of disagreement as to what the fundamental issue is all about. So let's go back to the fundamental issue. Why are we talking about sustainability today? Where did, where did it come from? You have had the word around all your life. It was born before you were. But my generation hasn't. It, it lurched onto our radar at one point, and we've been living with it ever since. But, but why all of a sudden are we talking about it? So let's go back in time to the fast growth of the post-war period and its acceleration in terms of the 1960s and 70s and 80s. Children were being born and we were all imagining that our kids would always have more and better than we would. There seemed to be no end to the possibilities of having things better and having more of them. Could that ever be sustained? There are, as Malthus said, limits to growth. And it became a lot more apparent in the late 70s and 80s that growth was something that couldn't be sustained forever. In fact, in the 1980s, the United Nations started doing research on all sorts of fronts that looked at the resources that we knew existed for minerals and coal and oil and all sorts of things, um, and asked the question, how fast are we using this in relation to the supply that we know is there? And in terms with population growth, in terms of expectations of an enlarged population, how long are those resources going to last before we are out? What they then did was to ask Grohal and Brundtland, who was a Scandinavian prime minister at the time, they gave her an impossible task. <clears throat> If you look at the way these resources are plummeting, you can see on a graph a date, a year, when we are going to have no more of them. And we can't replenish them. If you think about coal or oil, that's taken millions of years to be laid down, and we're about to use it all up. So they said to Grohal and Brundtland, set up a commission, which was called the World Commission on Environment and Development, it was set up in the mid 80s and it reported in 1987 with reports that you can find in your library. In France, it's called Notre Avenir à tous. In English, it's called Our Common Future. It's otherwise known as the World Commission on Environment and Development or the Brundtland Report for obvious reasons. It's a very important document and it was produced in 1987. And what Brundtland came up with, with her commission, was the answer that it is possible to extend, hopefully forever, the supplies of the things that we need. And it is possible to do it, even with an increasing population. But we have to change the rules of the consumerism game, the mining and extraction and the utilization of those resources, the terms of trade have to be changed. She called this concept, which she said was possible, she called it sustainability. And she said that there were four preconditions for sustainability. 
In other words, we could have it, but only if those four criteria are met. Well, I'm going to give you those four criteria now, and we're going to think together about whether, in fact, we see those criteria being met. The first one was that richer countries and their populations, their citizens, must live within the planet's ecological means. Do you have the impression that we are? Do you have the impression that we're putting a break on, on our consumerism? Do you have the impression that we are restraining ourselves in what we buy? That we are no longer buying into fashion that says we must change the colour or design of our clothes, even though we've got perfectly good clothes in the wardrobe? I don't. A few years ago, when I was working in the tourism industry in the 1980s, about 3% of the tourism market, the mass international tourism market, about 3% was interested in thinking about ecology and environment and impact upon the environment in their holiday decisions, whether they fly there by plane, whether they live under canvas, whether they go to a concrete hotel built on a new dune system somewhere. Only 3%. Do you know what the figure is now? Three and a bit percent after 30 years. Are the rich nations living within the planet's ecological means? We're beginning to get the message. If I talk to you for a moment about AIDA, A-I-D-A, awareness, interest, desire, and action. Some people are not aware. Some people are aware but not really that interested. Some people are aware and interested, but it doesn't really come out in any desire when it comes to consuming things. Some people have the awareness, the interest, the desire. They want to act and to do something, but they can't for some reason or other. Maybe there isn't a product or a service. Maybe they need advice. Maybe they need help. Maybe they need more money. Maybe they need the prices to be lowered of green goods and services. Somewhere in that continuum, we're getting stuck. So are the rich living within the planet's ecological means? We're trying, we're struggling, but from the moment, generally speaking, the mass of the world's population is not. Precondition number one. Does it hold water? Not at the moment. Number two. We should take a long-term view in the decisions that we individually, we professionally and commercially, we politically make. Are we doing that? Well, you talk to some investors and they say it's very difficult to see what on earth is going to happen in the next one or two years. It's almost impossible to plan long term for major investments. The economic horizons have got shorter. When I started work, um, we were looking at plans, long term plans that had a horizon of 25 to 30 years. Now, if you have a long term plan that's going beyond eight or 10 years, it's a miracle. Most plans are very much shorter. We're trying with this, aren't we? There's the Greta Thunbergs. There, are, there is the international climate um, movement, which is trying to get us into a more sustainable position where we keep the temperature of our planet down. There are all sorts of good signs, but are we really taking that long-term view in everything we do? Not really. The next one, companies, corporations, businesses, money. There should be a moral view and a moral responsibility taken that goes beyond the requirements of the law. The law always lags behind because it takes time to decide what we want. It takes time for people to put pressure on the system to produce the necessary piece of law. So, Brundtland said, companies who are making money 
who are making profit, they should be socially and morally responsible, and they should do more. There are certain things they should accept that legally they can do, legally they could do, but they should choose not to, because it's not in the long-term interest of the world, the population, consumers, and even their own shareholders, their actionnaires. Are we doing that? Well, echoing in the back of my mind, I have Milton Friedman. You all know the quote, I'm sure. The business of business is business. It's not to be philanthropic. It's not to give money away. It's not to be nice to other people. It's to be in business. And if you're successful in business and you're making a profit, you're making money for your shareholders, the companies grow, employment goes up, unemployment goes down. All of that is good. It's built into the model. Don't ask us, say the Friedmanites, to do philanthropic things. We're already doing things that help everybody. Well, if he's right and if people are doing that, it doesn't look like our moral case is being listened to. It doesn't look like Brunkland's third precondition is being kept to. The next one. The gap between the rich and poor nations should be reduced. Is it? Generally speaking, if you look at giving by nation states to poorer nations, to the peoples of poorer nations, it's a fraction of 1% usually in most government's accounts, a fraction of 1% of everything that we generate. And it's going down. And a lot of time that money comes with strings. We will build you a nuclear power station provided you commission it from us and our workforce. So we're giving a country to give us the money back to create employment back home. That's not exactly string-free money, now is it? So the gap is increasing. Climate change is hitting poorer countries harder than richer countries. It's hitting the weakest hardest, which means their incomes are going down and their ability to survive is going down with it. So the gap seems to be increasing, not reducing. Go to the Oxfam, O-X-F-A-M website, and you will see latest research on the amount of the world's resources that are owned by the top 1% of the world's population. That top 1% now owns more than 50% of the resources of the entire planet. 99% of people on Earth have to get by on half of the planet's resources. 1% has half all to itself. So is it all negative on this one, the gap increasing? Well, actually it's not. <clears throat> this is where globalization is having an effect. What has been happening to jobs and employment? Our salaries in the West, in the Northern Hemisphere have been stagnating. Our employment rates have been going up. Our manufacturing industries generally have been suffering very, very heavily. Where have the jobs gone? They've gone to what we used to call third world countries, China, India, uh, Brazil and South America, the Southeast Asian nations, etc., where, of course, labor costs are very low. Well, at least they were. But with all these jobs that have moved, those incomes are rising. You've only got to look, for example, at the tourism industry here in France. Over the last few years, there's been a gigantic growth in Chinese tourism. China nationals flying to Europe and spending an enormous amount of money and time in the uh, tourist paradises of France and in Europe you can tell that their incomes are rising. So there is some movement, but if I do this for you, like any two um, levels of water, if you have a barrier between them and you pull the barrier out, you don't get that. You don't get that. The two level 
up. One goes down and the other one goes up. So the problem is for us in the developed nations, our economic future is looking less bright. We are not increasing in real terms many of our incomes, certainly in the public sector. You look at teachers, our income relative to uh, others has fallen by 25% in the past five to 10 years very easily, our real incomes. So we've got a sense in which this gap may be closing, but it's causing us pain. Hopefully it's relieving pain elsewhere for people who don't have money. So there's all four of the Brundtland con uh, Commission's conditions, preconditions. Sustainability will work if you can do these things. Well, what did she describe sustainability as? She described it essentially as allowing those in the current generation to meet their own needs without prejudicing future generations in the meeting of their needs. Now, you can feel that in your heart. It's kind of it's kind of cute and warm, isn't it? You're doing something for your kids and grandkids. You're doing something for people on the other side of the planet. But does that tell you what you should be doing when you are going shopping or what you should not be doing? Does that tell the planning office what they should or shouldn't be building uh, in our towns and cities? It doesn't. It's a very soft kind of definition that anyone can describe in any way. Now, I'm going to have to finish this introduction and I'm going to finish it on a positive note. If you look back to John F. Kennedy's speech just after the Cuban Missile Crisis, bit before your time, I know, 1962 heading to 63, he went just after this crisis that nearly caused a third world war. It was a miracle. We were so close to the edge. And he went to the American University to give the graduation address to people like you, masters and degree students all dressed up in their caps and gowns, uh, ready to start their careers. He was reflecting on the Cuban Missile Crisis, but I will fast forward that to the crisis we're now facing with our climate and with our resources. He said, the problems of mankind are made by men, therefore they can be solved by men, and man can be as big as he wants to be. So we have it in our power, despite all those negative readings I've just given you, we have it in our power to change. But what's stopping us, and what do we need to be able to address this? Well, that has to be for a future video or two or three. Anyway, I hope that's set it up. I hope it's challenged you. I hope it's made it interesting for you. And I hope you look forward to the next videos as they come on. Okay, thank you very much indeed and see you later.